I'm Barisa Bryan. I live in Gloucester. I came to Gloucester when I was about six and um, I've lived here all of my life since then, um, although I've worked between Gloucestershire and Bristol. Currently I'm semi-retired and I work um, as a non-executive director with the NHS Trust in Gloucester. And prior to that I was um, in adult social care as my professional career. I'm Joyce Bennett. Um, I came here when I was five years old in Jamaica. I am a retired nurse. I worked for the NHS for about 40 years, did my nurses training, and then for the last 17 years I worked as a district nurse, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I don't remember when my parents came here. My dad came when I was one month old, mm -hmm. and my mum came when I was one. So I have no remember remembrance of them. That's yes. the same with me. I was about 18 months when my mother left and came to the UK. So I have no recollection mm. of um, her leaving at all. And I just remember throughout my childhood she being some distant mother, they told me when things arrived, like a doll would arrive, and mm -hmm. this was from your mother, and I was to be duly appreciative of it, but I was never allowed to play with the dolls and the toys because they were too precious because they'd come from England. So I would see it briefly, and then it would be put away somewhere where I might, you know, like in a cabinet or something, because, you know, it was too precious to play with. So she kind of was like some figment of mm. my imagination, really, I felt, very distant. Yeah, my dad, somehow or the other, all I remember my grandparents saying to me, don't fall down, don't hurt yourself because Lorenza will kill us. Because my dad would not allow us to go to school. Well, my sister could have gone to school because she was seven, but he didn't want us to go to school and nobody was allowed to hit us or smack us or do anything to us. Mm. So I was constantly being told, I can remember at five, don't fall down, don't hurt yourself, you're going to England soon, and there must be no mark on these two children. So we had to sit still. So we had the same thing. My mm. parents you used to bring, used to send dolls and nice clothes for us. We used to take photographs of them, mm. and then they had to be put away. Or we had to we had too much, so mm. we had to give to our cousins or somebody else, yeah. Mm. Well, initially I was left with my grandmother on my maternal side, so my mother's mum. And I don't know how long I stayed with her. And then my father came and took me because my mother they had separated by the time she'd left and he was in a different relationship so at some point he came and took me from my grandmother and I don't remember really what that was like so it must have been fairly early on probably but and, and I don't remember the separation it's just a sequence of events that I've been told so then I went with my father and um, lived with him until I came to the UK I don't remember a lot about that period of my life. Mm. I remember that he was a very strict person, really, really strict. You know, capital punishment or corporal punishment was a regular thing. I remember mm. that. Mm. And I remember when I came and I had a mark on, and I've still got it, actually. I think I, I got burnt, um, something that he did, and I got burnt. And when I came and my mum saw it, and she was really angry when she asked me what that was that. And I said, oh, that was daddy did that, and whatever. But um, there were some freedoms, because I remember there was a group of us children, I'm hmm. assuming some of them were step-siblings, or, and we used to have quite a lot of freedom running around. Hmm. Um, I remember we used to go to into the bush, and um, the older ones would, would um, use a slingshot and hunt birds and things, and then roast it over the fire, and, you know, we'd go and make dens and things like that, so... That bit had some nice memories mm. and I remember my father, he um, rode a motorbike and uh, he would sometimes take me on the back of the motorbike and I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I remember clinging on for dear life um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately that's how he died. 
Um, you? Yeah, oh. when I was about nine, we had a message to say that he died in a, oh. motor, a road traffic accident. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's what I remember. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I was left, my sister and myself, Nogla, we were left with my both grandparents. So we would spend, say, six months or three months with one grandparent and then we'd go to the other. Mm. And it was it was quite confusing. You never mm. felt as if you belonged anywhere. Mm. That's what I always felt. I never felt as if I anything was mine or, you know, my mother's mum, she was a very loving grandmother. She she really she well she came to England with Novlet and myself and she always all through our um you know, growing up in England we were very, all of us, the five of us, were very, very close to her. To, uh, mm. She was very loving towards us, extremely loving. Mm. I can relate to what you're saying about that feeling of not belonging. Yes. Because I never felt that I quite belonged with the no. rest of the children in the yard because they would tell me that I would be going to England at some point. Mm. You know, so there was always that expectation that I'm not going to be here. Mm. Um, and so this isn't really my home. So that was a bit unsettling. Mm. So I I came when I was about six. Um, so it was about four years since I'd been separated from my mum, maybe a little bit over four years. And I had no recollection of her at all. I remember uh, I was told I was going to England and because I'd been told periodically it didn't Mm. really kind of I was just like okay someday I'm going to go but this time it was actually going to happen so I was dressed up in uh, my finery with gloves on and a pretty dress and a hat Mm. and a lady that I didn't know was my escort on the plane so I think it kind of felt like it wasn't I knew it was happening, but it didn't feel real. Mm. And mm. on the plane journey, it was quite frightening because I didn't know where, who I was going to. You know, I knew I was going to my mother, but that didn't mean anything because mm. I didn't... Mm. I don't even know if I had a picture of her. And mm. certainly when the lady took me and said, this is your mum or your mother, and left me with her, I kind of looked and thought, oh, OK, this is my mum. And there was no kind of recollection because... There was just, she was just a stranger to me. And all the way on the trip from the airport to, to Gloucester, I was just kind of in shock because it was, everything was so different to Jamaica. The scenery, the weather, it was so gloomy. And, mm-hmm. and then when we got to the house, I was introduced to my sisters. It was just overwhelming because all mm. these strange people who were supposed to be related to me I didn't know what it meant to be honest with you Mm. I just felt a sense of isolation because it was another situation where they were a family kind of like what I'd left in Jamaica Mm. there were these other children Mm. who were a family and I was an interloper I wasn't part of that family they had a different name to me and things like that Mm. and so it just felt really surreal that's how I can describe it now of course as Mm. a child I didn't have that vocabulary but that's how it felt, really. I think I understand that, actually. Because although my gran came here and she was the stable person in all my life because she's the only one I remember, we've always been told, always been told, like what I said before, if you fall down, you know, better not fall down or hurt yourself because Lorenzo will kill us. And that was all we were ever told, you know? We were to sit still. And my mum came, when my mum introduced herself and said, I'm your mother, my mum gave us a big lecture on now we're in England, Mm. we are expected to behave in a certain way, to speak in a certain way. And and I remember at five, Mm. I just sat there and I just looked because I didn't know what else to do. Mm. I did, I felt completely lost. Mm. And then when I went to this funny house which was so small Mm. and, you know, this room. And I was thinking to myself, this is not even bigger than the kitchen at home, you know, (laughs) back home, yes. It was so um, overwhelming, I remember, as a little girl. I was standing Mm. up there just looking, I think. Mm. Yeah, but, I mean, when I came here, my mum was very young. 
I came here, she told, she, there was two little boys in the cot and this was your brother Roy and this is your brother Donald. You know, this is their toys and this is, and I, all I kept on hearing it was they belong in, it, everything belonged to other people. Mm. But um, I just felt, and I was a shy child, very, very shy. Mm. And I remember just standing up there, just standing and looking. Yeah. And that was it. Yes, I think yeah. I can relate to that very much as well because I remember my mum um, always <coughs> referred to me as being shy and quiet, the quiet one. Yeah. She's the quiet one. And I think, I mean, now as an adult, I know I kind of lost myself in books. That was my escape. Mm-hmm. I just read and read and read and read. And she never could understand why I liked reading so much, but it just took me to a different place mm. sometimes I didn't really I didn't communicate with them very much because my there was real life and then there were my books right mm. and I prefer to spend much more time in my books mm. and sometimes she would say to me why, why don't you go outside and play with the others and whatever but because I was the eldest and she was young like your mum mm. they were all young weren't they, they, they were they came here and always working and busy and, and mm. so being the eldest and you know it was made very clear you're the eldest you've got responsibility you need to make sure your sisters get to school on time my sisters were five and six years younger than me so I had to make sure they got up had breakfast their hair was done and everything like that not immediately but that was kind of my role was to be big sis yeah that was the expectation that I would fit Step in that in. role yeah. yeah and it wasn't a question of whether you wanted to do it or not that was the role oh, that was yes. assigned to you yeah, and yeah. obviously yeah. because you saw that your mother was kind of you know really under pressure mm. you just did did it anyway yeah, you, you know did, did. so yeah it was kind mm. of I don't know not much of a childhood really no I think you 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 grew up I think I I just grew up yeah. in fact I, I remember just standing and I understand what you say about losing yourself mm-hmm. in a book or lo- I used to sometimes watch my dad didn't like us watching anything on telly that was violent at all and um, I remember watching a television programme and actually felt as if I was in there. It's a really funny feeling. You want to belong to something, but you don't know how to. Mm. You don't know how. Mm. Well, as I said, I fairly quickly stepped into the big sister role. I think sometimes my sisters kind of resented that because, you mm. know, I was quite bossy I had to tell them to do things you know you had to get up and get get dressed right you know get to school and all of that and supervise them so they didn't always appreciate that I think because there was quite a gap between us as well we didn't really have a lot in common and my two sisters they're a year apart so they're they're just like that you know really close so they had each other and I was just there to supervise them Having said that, you know, as we kind of got older and got to know each other a little bit more, we did bond, but I bonded much more with my youngest brother, who he was born when I was nine, and really just became his surrogate mother. You know, from a baby, I remember washing his nappies and things like that, and we've always been very, very close. In terms of my relationship with my mum, it was, it's never what I would have wanted we never had that closeness. We didn't mm. have that bond. I know it's fairly common with women of that generation. They would never really sort of say, I love you and things like that. Um, it wasn't a common thing. And I certainly never heard that during my childhood. I knew she cared about me. Um, she expressed that you know, in, in terms of nurturing and making sure that we had enough to eat and good clothes and things like that, Mm. but that relationship that you would want to have, that closeness with your mum, I felt that was missing. I I, I agree agree with you, Bruta, but I can now look back and see in my own experience with my children, I understand why why it happened. Mm. She She was far too young. She was very young, four little children, and then... It was their house, but they they seemed to have rented out lots of rooms. So there was a lot of people living together. 
and it was quite difficult I think for for mum mm. yeah. yes as you say you know uh, in hindsight and as an yeah. adult you can rationalize yes it. you can you can <clears throat> and you can. um you was, kind of understand, you know, what they must have gone through and the stresses and all of that. But mm. as a child who no. needed that no. and didn't get it, no. that was difficult. Mm. Uh, that was difficult. And and they were of that generation that you, you couldn't say, even as an adult, I couldn't sit and say to my mum, well, mum, I would have really liked to have a different relationship with you mm. and just have that conversation mm. because... As a child, you weren't supposed to speak to them <laughs> in that way, were you? You were oh, not no, supposed no, no. to have those kind of conversations. You seen and not heard. Yes, and you didn't ask. I mean, I, for example, I didn't really know. I still don't really know a lot about my father, my biological father. And I remember asking her once or twice, what was, what was he like? And she clearly didn't want to talk about it. And I got that message and I never asked again. And, um, yeah, so there's a big piece of my history that I don't really know mm. anything about. Mm. It would have been nice to be able mm. to talk to her. But clearly, I don't know what happened, but, you know, it was, some, it was a, something she didn't want to revisit. So I had to accept that. And that's not to say that we didn't have a bond, mm. because we did. But, yeah, it, it wasn't what I needed, I mm. think. I'd express it that way. I think we are more different with our own children, aren't we? Um, maybe we we've gone too much the other way, <laughs> but mm. we we do try to be more. What should I say? Gentle or mm. or more? The, my parents, especially my dad, was very very strict. He was really really strict on mm. us with the church with everything. Dad was strict of television even what we watched on telly what we didn't watch and he was very very strict and uh, my sister Novlet now Novlet had a free spirit and <laughs> she just couldn't they could not control her and she would not allow them to <laughs> Novlet oh my goodness relationship with my mum my mum had a very strong, she, she was a very strong lady. Dad always said that she had a privileged life. She was brought up, went to a private school and different things. And Dad said she don't know nothing about hardship. So <laughs> he always provided well. So my mum, my relationship, I was a doer and it was fine. I, I did the washing, the cooking, the cleaning. I was a doer, and that's how I saw my role in my in the family. It was sort of finding something that you could a very shy person, extremely shy, with my sister very loud, and she wouldn't do nothing novelette didn't want to do nothing. There is no way she was going to do it, so Joyce did it for her, so we didn't get into trouble, so it was um. It was like that, really. I wouldn't say it was fear. It was doing as you told without question. Yeah, there was. There were expectations, weren't yes. there? And they were made very yeah. clear. Yeah. So, for example, I remember, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of girls our generation had the same kind of conversation. When I started my periods, and I came, I, that's it. Started at school. I had no idea what was happening to me. Aww. I just went to the toilet and there was blood in my knickers and I thought, I'm going to die, there's something wrong. Mm. And they sent me home with a note. Nobody said anything to me. They just packed me off home with a note. And I thought, well, that's it. You know, <laughs> there's definitely something wrong here. So I, I went home and I gave the note to my mum and um, she was like, okay, yes, you start your period. And, you know, she showed me the mechanics of what I needed to do. And then I got the lecture. And no matter, no matter make sure you don't get pregnant. Mm. And that was that was the, the sole um, conversation. You, you were told what to do to make sure you were clean and tidy. And then just don't get pregnant. For me, because I was, I perceived myself to be somewhat distant from the family, there was always this thing with me that I had to be good. 
And so I was, I was the quiet one and I was the good one. Mm. I had to behave myself because I might be left again because I was left. Mm. Yeah, the others weren't left, I was left. Mm. And so I never openly rebelled mm. um, against my mum's authority at all. I was always quietly compliant, but I had my own ways of rebelling on the quiet be so that I wouldn't get into trouble and that I could never be held up as the one that was causing the pr a problem. Mm. So, mm. yeah, that, that's, that's how it was. There was that distance of you had to have respect. You had to, there were some rules that you just didn't break because, you know, it was made very clear. Mm. You don't do that. You don't get pregnant. There were certain things that were laid down mm -hmm. and you just followed them. Now, my sisters, it was a different kettle of fish. <laughs> so, for example, um, I remember my mum buying me school uniform one year and I absolutely hated it. You know, it was mini skirts and all that. My skirt was like down to my calves and I had tough shoes, you know, the brand tough shoes. Yes, and I, I hated them. I and what I used to do is every morning I'd um, leave the house wearing my tough shoes. But I made sure I had my, my daps in my bag. And as soon as I put the corner, the tough shoes came off and I preferred to wear my daps all day. And I'd roll up the skirts mm. so till the waist was about three inches thick, but it was short. But you never break the corner to come on your street and before you pull the skirt back down, right? So it was the right length. But I remember my sister now, one of my sisters, um, one year when my mum bought the school uniform, she was like, I'm not wearing that. What'd you buy that for? No, I'm not wearing that. I could never, ever no, no, you wouldn't. say that to my mum. It was just not the done thing, but they could. My sister Novlet would, mm -hmm. but she had a, my dad, I think she was my dad's favourite child, but she would smile, really, she could, she could, she could ring people around their finger and she'd give them a lovely smile and it's, did I, did I, oh, you know, that sort of, mm -hmm. and they, my dad would say, cha, and that was it. I, I remember my mum used to buy us these really tough shoes, I know, with laces up, mm. and you walked and they squeaked, mm. Mm. you know. And Novelet, I remember Novelet saying to me, you steer dear, I'm not wearing that. <laughs> oh. There was never any question in my mind of going back. It was never presented that I had an option. So I just thought, well, I'm here, I'm gonna make the best of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll make sure that I follow the rules, I don't get into trouble, and that was it, really. I remember coming here, when my gr one of my grandparents, my dad's um, parents, they lived, had a big farm, so, and then coming from there to this little garden, we, we got into so much trouble, we would break the glass, I remember mum bought me, brought us a coat, and I jumped the gate, tear up the the coat we were playing ball inside the this little room inside the house breaking the glass in the cabinet that was novelette that was novelette not me but you know it was it was quite difficult for us because it, it was so confined i i just could not believe this is it this is where you and there was lots of people living in this one house I, I couldn't, couldn't uh, not understand how anybody could live like that or how the place was so small. It was my dad's house and then my uncle bought it from dad because mum couldn't cope with people living in the same house as, as, you know, as herself and all this. And I go, when I go back there, the house was quite a big house. But in my mind's eye, it was small, mm -hmm. it was teeny it was ridiculous mm. <laughs> you used to an open space <laughs> um yes my new siblings well everybody was new to me even my mum <laughs> so everything was new and I had two sisters who were already there I did have a third sister but I don't remember meeting her because she died quite young of sickle cell but I hear the stories all the time of her death was quite traumatic, especially for my mum. So the stories mm. would be told quite often. So I feel as if I know her, but I don't think I met her. Sometime later, probably about three or four years later, my stepbrother, my stepfather's son came. So he was somebody new, get used to. And then my younger brother was born. I remember I quite looking forward to his 
birth actually mm. because at the time it was the Jackson 5 were that was they were my thing and I was desperate for my mum to call the baby I don't know why how I knew it was a boy but him to be called Michael and I I, I sort of told her that that would be my wish <laughs> that he should be called Michael so when she came home from hospital and um, <laughs> he wasn't called Michael I was quite annoyed. <laughs> I was quite annoyed and very disappointed. Uh-huh. How old <laughs> um, were you then? Nine. Oh. Yeah. But um, as I say, he, you know, I, he was my first baby. I became his surrogate mum, so it was fine in the end. But I was just really annoyed with her that she hadn't mm. caught in Michael like I wanted her to. Oh. But yeah, it was fine. I mean, mm. we had good times. Like we, we had a lot of freedom in those days. Mm. We just lived around the corner from church. Um, when I first came, and there was where, where <clears throat> was the car park now? There, there was um, a big field and trees, and we used to make dens really? all the time. Yeah, and we could go out as long as we came back for meals because there were a few of us. Because there was my stepfather's sister, two sisters who lived next door, I think, and their children. We all used to just go off together okay. and play, mm. and the park was just you know, Mm. down the road. Mm. So we had quite a lot of freedom, um, which was good. So there were, there were good times. Yeah. I got on quite well with my brother. Roy, he follows me. So Roy was two years younger than me. And then Donald was three years younger than than me. And I did, I I got on quite well. I, we were always being told this is the, the boys toys and this is your toys. It was always, I always felt this was theirs and mm. this was mine, mm. you know. And but we we had lovely toys. My pa- my mum and dad they always provided very well for us, extremely well. But you still felt a bit lost. I think mm. I've felt a bit lost all my life. All my life, because there you don't belong. Mm. You don't belong to anyone really. So on a Thursday, every single Thursday, we used to go around to my house. And sometimes my dad didn't like us going there because we were watching Top of the Pops. <laughs> and we shouldn't be watching Top of the Pops. And we used to always have to make sure that we're out before dad comes home on a, on a Thursday. And the five of us used to, we used to run out as fast as we could and go around to my grand's Mm. and stay there until later. She, she was, she sort of gave me a sort of an anchor, a belonging, Mm -hmm. because she's always been there from I can remember. So I think I was probably lucky with that. I take on a lot of responsibility in my family. I take on sometimes... I don't even think they even give it to me because I take it. Mm -hmm. I take on, like, you know, looking after my parents, making sure that my other siblings are okay. I seem to be take on caring as a job. And I think I do that so that I feel as if that's where I belong. I think when I look back sometimes it's quite funny actually because um, um, my mum when she went to Jamaica to live I remember being at the airport and I Maxine and uh, I was there Maxine also she came here when she was a lot older she was about 12 or 14 Mm -hmm. and Maxine and I were in the toilet and I was crying my eyes out because my mum was a was abandoning me again Mm. and I had four children I you know I was a big woman yeah I I understand that very well because um, I I don't think it's strange I think it's quite natural because you know as I said before I felt that sense of abandonment I I didn't understand it Mm. um, until I was much older in fact until after I'd had my own children and you know when you hold your baby in your arms and um, when they get to milestones and I was thinking gosh my mum left me when I was that young how must it have felt for me Mm. um and and as I said one of the things that I always assumed responsibility for was to be good and not to cause any trouble because I didn't want to be left again I didn't want to Mm. be abandoned again and so I think that's the legacy from that whole generational thing that I think a lot of people who were left 
carry with them yes, through they life. Yes, they do. Yeah, other they friends do. that, well, you know, we've talked to yes. others, and that yeah. theme comes around all of the time. Yeah. Mm. And this, you have this inbuilt thing that you've got to be strong. You've got to be mm. a strong person. You've got to be strong for your family. You've got to be strong for your children, you know. Mm. You have to be a strong woman. You must not be in a situation where you cannot provide mm. for yourself, for your children. for And you carry that. I've carried that mm. all the way through my life, you know, from when I from a little girl mm. standing up looking and feeling as if what do I do now mm. you know mm. it is it is very sad actually in my mind's eye I can see this little girl just standing there completely lost mm -hmm. completely lost I did not know what what's expected of me mm. who so you you sort of try to sort of find something what they will be pleased with you for mm. they will you know my dad was always building every house we lived in my dad has had it on or built something and he the whole place used to be in a mess so i used to go and tidy it all up i sit at the end of the day um hoover out the place tidy it up and my mum always said to me i you know i'm is is joyce that keep this place tidy you know, and I, I like to hear that. Mm. I like to hear that. I don't think I ever felt threatened that they would leave me again. Mm. But I I wanted to appraise. My sister was very good academically. I wasn't. And my dad always compared me to my sister. Novelet was seven when she came here and I was five. But I was still expected to be able to read, to be able to do everything like her. Because I, I think probably in those, in they didn't understand how people learn differently mm -hmm. and how things, not everybody is the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, but I, I, I think it was quite, I wouldn't like one of my children to have gone, to go through, go through what I felt. Mm -hmm that lost. I don't know and I understand why they came here. I understand why they came here. They thought they were coming to, you know, to make life and to have a better, to give us a better life, mm, you yes. know. I remember having or hearing conversations about the reasons why they came, which was obviously around, you know, taking the opportunity to make a better life and earn some money and go home. Um, but there was never a sort of sitting down and saying, you know, I left you because I wanted to make a better life for you. We just assumed that when we got older. You know, as children, you'd hear the adult conversation around you. You weren't supposed to comment or be part of it because that was big people talking, right? And we were kids. <laughs> so you just, um, you know, mm. we were just little people with big ears that listened. Uh, and so you assumed okay, we, they came because they wanted to make life better for us. And, you know, I remember speaking to um, a friend of mine who, um, <laughs> she said, um, we were talking about this very thing about why they left and how we felt about it. And she said, you know, I'm really glad that, um, that my parents came. She said, because the first time I went back to Jamaica to where we were from in the country mm -hmm. and I saw you know, the higgler, them on the roadside, she said, <laughs> she said, probably I, if, if my mum hadn't come, I would be one of them higgler on the red roadside with one teeth in my head. Oh. <laughs> That's, you know, generally I think we appreciate the fact that they did come because they wanted to mm. build a better future mm. for us. And they went through so much yes. in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do appreciate that they made that effort and it's it's mm. you know it's mm. given us uh, opportunities that we wouldn't have had otherwise but that still doesn't mean that there were things missing so my relationship i i speak really of my relationship with my mother because that's the central relationship with me we we got on well i know she cared for me and i know that um she was appreciative of the fact that I didn't really give her a lot of trouble. 
and and you know she appreciated the fact that I just kind of got on with mm. thing with being the the big sister and you know doing things to help her. She did say that, you know, we had a good relationship, but as I say, that that closeness. We it, we didn't have it. There was always something missing. It was mm. never quite mm. what I would have wanted it to be. Um, mm. And I think some of it might have been generational. Um, like, you know, the, the whole thing that, you, you know, I'm your parent. And, and, you know, from a Caribbean background, that generation expected a certain form of respect. And um, if they didn't get it, it was quite distressing for them. Because I know in terms of my my mum's relationship with my younger siblings who were much more rebellious than me she found it really difficult sometimes so I think mm. she was quite glad that there was at least one of us that she had an easier time mm. with so yes it, it was it was okay um, it was good in parts but there was something missing uh, my relationship with my siblings my sisters particularly I've always been big sis and um like you, Joyce, expected to be the one that if there's a problem, they come to me. If there's a problem, I sort it out. I'm the one that has to take responsibility things. And for a long time, I carried that mantle. But after many, many years, I kind of started to push that back a bit because mm. it's not it's not what it's not the role that I want. Mm. And after a while, it just became too heavy. And, you know, we're all adults now, so everybody needs to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in in some areas, that still doesn't work because like when my parents were ill, I took the major responsibility. I suppose there has to be somebody in the Mm -hmm. family that Mm -hmm. the buck stops with, and it's always been me. And sometimes that was okay, and sometimes it wasn't okay. I didn't want to be Mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have that responsibility. I wanted to be free like everybody else. But that was mm. not the role in the family that was allocated to me. Mm. Yeah, I, I understand that. I really do understand. But I felt that, I don't know, looking after my dad, mum and dad, mm-hmm. and being there for them. Um, I remember we went. I went to Jamaica, my sister and my younger sister and myself, we went to Jamaica to stay with mum and dad for just a holiday but it was no holiday I was taking dad backwards and forward to the hospital but I think he was de- suffering from dementia starting from there or even longer than that really I don't know I think everybody stepped back that's what it is really everybody stepped back and allowed Joyce to do it because Joyce can do it well mm. and Joyce just happened to be a nurse and then I just you did you just you just did because I I, I couldn't leave them I mm. couldn't there there was something inside of me that I could never dad went into a nursing home but I was there every day nearly you know just to make sure they didn't even know when I was coming sometimes I'd be doing my rounds in that area and I'd pop in just to make sure I, as they shaved him have they done this have they done the other don't think that's because you know my dad's in here you're going to be doing on anything and anything to him. So I used to pop in and they just, but they were very good with him. They were very good with Lorenza. And um, sometimes you don't want to, do you? Mm-hmm. You want to be the one that um, just sits back and, but no, I, 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 I think I blame myself. It is myself because I've allowed this, t- it to happen. And I was glad I, I was able to do what I did mm-hmm. for, my mum and dad and my sister in the Mm. end it was very difficult and I think my brothers and sisters I think they all respect me Mm. I think they do yeah I have a feeling sometimes I think I'm still not an equal to them you know because I they still think I'm this person who's done this wonderful thing and you know sometimes I don't want to be I just Mm. want to be me my childhood experience impacted on my parenting. I think in the most profound way, wanting to make sure that my children knew that I loved them and having a very close relationship with them because I didn't have that with my mum and also with my grandparents. 
the only time I remember my grandmother, I don't remember when I was left with her, as I said earlier, but when my parents went back to Jamaica before they became ill, my grand was still alive, and so a couple of times when I went to visit them, she was there. But that was the only time I knew her, and by then she had dementia and wasn't herself and whatever. So I want to be the grandparent I never had to my grandchildren. And I wanted to be the mother that I always wanted to my children. Mm. And and as you said, Joyce, maybe sometimes you go too much the other way in that. But I hope that we have a closer relationship and mm. I hope that they know that I will always be there for them and I'll never leave them the way that my mother left me. Yeah, that's always been kind of the primary driving mm. force, I think, for me in terms of my parenting. For me, I was speaking to James today, the youngest one, and he rang me and he was, we were talking and he was saying, thank you, Mum, for providing for us, because I was a worker, a worker. When I was going to work and working, I always made sure they were safe, they were all right, everything was done, we said prior before we went, I went, and he said he got the work ethics from watching me, but he always felt safe, and he thanked me for a happy childhood, because he said he thought everybody was happy as a child, with food, with, you know, safe, they knew they were home, you know, their home was always there, their friends could come and go as much as they wanted mm. to, and um, he said when he went off to university, he thought that's how everybody lived. Then um, he had this girlfriend and she was, you know, her mother, well, she didn't even bother with her. You know, um, he said at times she was hungry as a little girl because mum didn't, there was no food there. There was, you know, she was ignored. She went to school dirty. And James just said to me, mum, I can't believe it. <laughs> He said he could not, he thought that's how everybody lived, the way, you know, we brought him up and he felt loved. And I thought, uh, you know, that was such a lovely, and I thanked him for, for saying that because you, you try your very best. Mm. And as a grandma, now I've got my grandma, which I try to be like. She was such a, such a lovely lady. She stuck up for us. And my brother, Donald, and he was a naughty boy. He used to get into a lot of trouble. But my gran always knew when to come round to see, to our house. And she used to say to my mum, you don't need to beat that boy. If you don't want him, I'll have him. Come, brother Dan, come, we're going home. You don't have to keep on beating him. If you don't want him, I'll have him. And she was always like that. You know, we used to go berry picking. And mum used to come back with all this money. And mum used to say that uh, we have to take it and buy school clothes and or something. And my gran, she always came. She used to say to me, oh, no, put on no clothes. Oh, no, going into town to deal with me. And bring on no money, no picking money. And she used to be saying to my mum, these poor children go and pick from morning to night. And you had to tell them so. <laughs> <laughs> so she always knew, she always. So I try to be the grandmother I knew. The grandmother that made you feel safe and made you feel happy mm. that you could go there any time. I said, Mama, she'd say, I remember the school, there was a school trip going to Italy years ago and it was quite a bit expensive, something. And I I wanted to go and um, my mum said, no, I can't go. And I just mentioned it to my gran and she said to me, no, you're not going. And then two days later, she come round and she said, come, we're going in a town. And I said, what for now? Well, you need clothes to go to Italy, don't you? <laughs> All five of us talk a lot about her and how loving she was towards us. So I always say to my children, I would like to be the grandmother, you know, like how she was to us. I was 21 when she died and I felt as if my mum had died and she died. But... I think it was probably because she was always, I've always known her. Mm. She was like the stable part of our, of my life. 
because it's, it is quite sad to think that a little girl of three, five, coming over and saying, somebody introducing you to your mum and dad. But then it's life, isn't it? People have to make life. In terms of what's happened to me, is an, I've, I've got a lot of friends, but I don't like people being too close to me. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make it work. You know, it is. It's a very strange sort of feeling. Very strange. Mm. The good thing is, um, I came when I was five. Some people don't come until they're 14 or 15. You know, I think, I think my parents did the best they could. For me, the worst thing, I think, is that the legacy of that feeling of abandonment, that break in that very formative period of your life where you make attachments to your parents, and that just didn't happen. So for me, that's the worst thing because that's had impact throughout my life. I think the best thing is I'm really grateful for the opportunity it's given me personally that my mum made that choice to come here. Um, because it's enabled me to have a career that I probably wouldn't have had mm. if she didn't. An education that I wouldn't have had. I, I definitely wouldn't have had the education I've had. And I think even though it's taken a while to kind of address some of the issues, and I'm not saying I've addressed all of them by any mm. means, it's made me a stronger person. I think that it has made me a stronger person.